I'd like you to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. And uh, we're going to finish off, uh, it's a sort of two-parter last week and this week, on the Trinity. Finishing off the Our Awesome God series. I'm going to move on into the book of Acts after that. Or, and uh, so th- this little series that I've been doing over the probably several months we conclude it. We're looking at the Trinity. We're looking at the nature of God in some ways. It's awesome stuff. But let's use this scripture as a, a background as we come to, to spend a few minutes. And I want to try and apply this awesome truth, understand it and apply it uh, to our lives. So Hebrews 1 and verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The Trinity is an amazing truth and it, it, it's something that's come through Revelation I'd like to put up on the screen, uh, if you've got it, guys, the, the, the little summary of doctrine. I don't know if, is that working, that PowerPoint? The one that starts, God the Father, the God the Father is God. If there isn't one, don't worry, we're still trying to, it's post John Attill, so there's a few hiccups in, he used to do the PowerPoints for me. Okay, don't worry. But last time, there it is, thank you. Last time we just summarised this, uh, it's a, a sort of doctrinal summary of, of Christian truth. God the Father is God, God the Son is God, God the Holy Spirit is God. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father. Nevertheless, there is only one God. Now, that isn't uh, uh, meant to be like a tongue twister or something, some funny little thing. That is a statement of truth as it is revealed to us in the Bible. And last week, we talked quite a bit about that. So if you really are interested and you weren't here last week, you probably ought to download the message from last week or get a CD or something, just to get two parts. It's very difficult for me, particularly the time pressures, to run over what I said last week. But that is a summary of the truth that's revealed in Scripture. Now, down through the centuries, this doctrine of the Trinity has obviously baffled people, and indeed it's caused many battles as well. That's not surprising because what we touch with this doctrine is the otherness of God, the mysterious nature of God. Whenever we encounter new thoughts and new ideas, we struggle with them and we try to fit them into, say, pre-existing categories or experiences we understand. We try to draw analogies and things like that, which is quite okay normally, but it is rather difficult when you get to something as totally unique as God himself. In Isaiah 40, verse 25, we have this amazing statement. God challenges us. To whom then will you compare me? Says the Holy One. (laughs) To whom then will you compare me? And it's a challenge like you can't compare me to anything. We can't. And people do try and it's a well-intentioned, you know, Patrick, St. Patrick with his shamrock or people talk about ice and steam and water and they try and compare the Trinity to something but you can't really do it without limiting it and distorting it. Our language tends to fail because we're so limited by time and space. We are utterly bound by them. We, of course we are. Our very definition of who we are is, is very, very affected by time boundaries and spatial boundaries. So, for example, a person to us is very much an individual, like me, separate from you, totally, 
and in a sense locked into a bit of a time-space world. I'm me at this moment preaching to you. That is my whole experience of what a person is and my identity as a person. And to be a human being is to be a person and just one person. So being a human being is very much linked to that brief sort of identity I've talked about. But it just isn't so with God. It just, let's accept, it isn't so. There is a difference between being and a person. That, that's a fact. There is, a, if you like, a philosophical fact. For us, of course, being a one human being and a person, one person, one space, one time, moment, all the time, you know, I'm just here and that's me. Well, that, that, that's obvious. But with God, the being of God is one, but that being has three persons. Three eternal, co-equal persons. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not like a third of him is Father, third Son. He's not three equal parts. One being and all of them are all of him. Or totally divine. Or, uh, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, I've, I know I think I've said this analogy before and I don't want to over push it but we've got to try and understand why is it so puzzling to us well just let's think of it uh, sort of down here for a moment everything that exists has a being a rock has the being of being a rock a tree has the being of a tree a dog has the being of a dog and a man or a woman has the is a human being now not every being is personal a rock is not personal A tree is not personal. A tree is not a person. It's the being of a tree, but it's different from us. A dog perhaps has some self-awareness, but it lacks personhood, personality. Actually, it would seem in the whole universe, there are three kinds of being that are truly personal. Us, mankind, human beings, angels, and God. Now, as I've been saying, my being is very limited and very finite. One person, one place, one time. That's very much a definition. But here, when we talk about this whole subject, we're beginning to touch the being of God. And his being differs very much from my being. Let's go back to my first illustration. There's a lot of difference between a tree and you. I know we sound rude to each other and suggest there isn't, but there is a lot of difference. A tree is alive, it it multiplies itself, it takes in food and water, but its being is totally, it's not got any of the consciousnesses and self-awarenesses. It's totally different, yet it's a living thing on the planet sharing it with us. And actually, our difference from God is probably bigger than the difference of a tree to you. So when we're talking about this, we're talking about God as he is and how he's revealed himself. And it's often right outside our experience. God is himself infinite, unlimited. We saw all this earlier. Omnipresent, omniscient. He is beyond our comprehension. And he is three persons, one God. Now, it may even be the way he communicates to us to help us understand it, if you like. But that is a fact. We receive his revelation and take it. The key fact is that there is full, complete, equal participation in the divine being. That the Son is truly God. The Spirit is truly and fully God. And it is unorthodox and heretical groups that always deny one of those things. They take from Jesus. He is not fully God. He's just a prophet, just a good man, just a super angel, a created, made uh, being of his own. He's a different sort of being. All sorts of cults and groups and, uh, and religions, actually, will take from that. And that is where they undermine the truth that is revealed in Scripture. So the fact is there's a consistent revelation in Scripture on the deity of Jesus Christ and the deity of the Holy Spirit. And yet the Bible is firmly monotheistic from beginning to end. All the writers in the New Testament, for example, assume and believe the truths that we're trying to describe. Here's a quote from B.B. Warfield. The whole book is Trinitarian to the core. All its teaching is built on the assumption of the Trinity. And its allusions to the Trinity are frequent, cursory, easy and confident. 
Let's get to the key issue. What revealed this Trinitarian truth? There's no doctrine of the Trinity laid out in Scripture. It doesn't have a philosophical sort of treatise on the Trinity. So what is it that revealed it? And this is the key fact. The incarnation and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the experience of meeting Jesus and all that went round with Jesus, his death and resurrection, all he taught, all he did, that and the experience of the Holy Spirit drove, if I can put it that way, the New Testament writers to be Trinitarian in their understanding of God. Nobody uses the word Trinity. They're not trying to formulate a concept sitting in their sort of ivory tower trying to work it out. They experience Trinity. They are, as I said last week, experiential Trinitarians. And that is the origin of the whole thing. If you like, the revelation of the Trinity was sort of incidental to and inevitably came from meeting Jesus and understanding the, re- the, the redemption and then experiencing the Holy Spirit and understanding who he was. It just came from that experience. It was revelation. They walked with the Son. They saw him die. They saw him rise again. They heard the Father speak from heaven, from glory. They were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. They listened to the teaching. They understood what was going on to a measure. And, and the Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. But there's one God. And that is in Scripture. Now, later in history, church history, defences had to be made against people saying Jesus wasn't God or isn't God. The Holy Spirit is just a force. He's not God or something else. And so as you defend those things, you you define what's been come to be called the doctrine of the Trinity. But actually, it's not about a doctrine. It's about wonderful truths about our living God. And what I want to spend a few minutes with you this morning, now in this last few minutes really, is why is that important? Why is it important anyway? It would be very easy to say, well, does it matter? Well, actually, as I explained last week, it probably doesn't matter for you to understand all the intricacies of the arguments, but it really matters that God is Trinitarian. It really matters that Father, Son and Holy Spirit are all God, but there's one God. That sort of statement that we've had up there before. You don't need to put it up again. It really matters that those things are true. And I'll try and share with you why. So let's look at a few things, wonderful things that come from what God has shown us about himself. Here's the first one. The personal and relational nature of God comes through the truth of the Trinity. And this is very, very wonderful, but important too. If God is not Trinitarian, we're saying something like this. God is like us. He's a great big version of one being, one person. So he's like a giant version of us, one being, one person. If that's true, but he's still God, uncreated, eternal, and uh, from eternity past to eternity future, and from his one personhood, if you like, one monolithic person created the world. If that's true, God has no existing relationships within his own being. So whatever his relationship is with us, It is not going to be personal, really. He doesn't really understand personal relationships. He's like one big lonely version of us. And he doesn't understand personal relationships. In fact, he's finding out as he's gone through creation what it's like to relate to people and be relational. He's learning as he goes along. That's quite scary. That's quite disturbing. If that were true, and we take that to its logical conclusion... But here is a wonderful fact. The Bible clearly reveals that God is very personal and fully understands personal relationships. Indeed, he has created us in his image. We're the problem when we try to be hyper-individual. He has made us to be in relationships and to some extent to not be independent little units, but interdependent. He fully understands relationships, We are made in the image of a personal, relational God, Trinitarian God. Actually, all sorts of things come from that. Love only has real meaning if God is Trinitarian and has has love in himself, mutual service, mutual regard, one person of the Godhead for the other. 
Islam, for example, reflects the fact that if you have a monolithic, impersonal God, you don't have much time for love and faithfulness and these sort of personal qualities. That's how it is. And of course, the very origins of Islam are a defiance against Trinitarian teaching. It is supremely saying he's one personal God. You know, this Trinitarian stuff is, is wrong. And, and, and actually, this God is, is deeply... Uh, and worryingly distant and you, you know he don't quite know what he's going to do and it's not a personal thing there's not a love thing a faithfulness thing in there it, because that is, that is logical that's right but actually God has not revealed himself to be like that he's revealed himself to be a personal God a God who understands relationships a God who is love who is faithful and who is yet complete in himself he's not learning about these things just since he made us He's actually made us in his image. And far from God teaching, uh, sorry, us teaching God anything about relationships, he teaches us about relationships in lots of ways. The Trinity truth is an attack on our hyper-individualism, which is an aberration of how we're meant to be. We have got worse and worse at it. Our culture has got more and more individualistic. It's happening all the time. You now have everything is your own little tiny package, if you're not careful, isolated from other people. We often view freedom as freedom from others. Freedom from other people is freedom. That is a result of sin. That's not good news. God, in his glorious Godness is not free from one another. The three persons are totally, mutually dependent and loving. And they don't go off to have me time. The Father doesn't have me time away from the Spirit and the Son. They've got it right. We've got it wrong. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to have me time. I like me time. Don't misunderstand me. Go, oh, John says I can't have any time on my own. Look, I'm just telling you, we think we're right, we're not. God's right. What I'm telling you is God understands relationships. We learn from him. Now, there's some very real places where the rubber hits the road. For example, the relationship between the sexes. God made men and women to some extent reflecting the Trinity. To some extent, humanity is only seen properly when you get male and female. There's a complementarity about it. And God made us male and female in his image. He's not just like one giant macho man. God is not like that. And and actually, the sort of balance and complementarity and and mutual dependence that's there is something God wants us to see. And also the mutual love and regard, which in its ideal is perhaps dimly reflected in the best of marriages, the best Christian marriage. You're dimly reflecting something of how this relationship in the Trinity works, where there's mutual submission and order, yet there's... There's no asserting, there's no exploitation, there's a love balance and a mutual regard and serving. And, and different roles are not fought over, but are honoured. And that is how it's meant to be, because God himself is like that. We're actually made by a God who understands community. We're made by a God who's a community. We're made by a God who understands fathering. In fact, fatherhood comes from God. He is the father of all. And, and actually, he's not saying, oh, look, I made these funny little things, and look, there's some fathers emerged. Oh, that's interesting, because I've been this great lonely one thing. No, no, actually, God is the Father, and the Father and the Son have have understood fathering and sonning forever. (laughs) And we're being brought into his image. We're the ones that are learning from him, whether it's our relationships, men and women, or family relationships. Loving one another, serving one another, honouring one another, submitting to one another. These things come from the perfection of the Godhead. They come out of the perfection of the Godhead himself. Team leadership is a God thing. The whole universe is run by a team. Not by run by one tiny little pinprick one off at the top of the pyramid the whole thing's run by a team the whole thing is run by a plurality father son and holy spirit they were all involved in creation they're all involved in redemption isn't that amazing and we think it's so much you know like uh, all sorts of human societies end up with this idea that you get the one guy at the top who, who calls all the shots and yet there's a sense in the trinity the father is honored but there's a sense that that isn't how it is That there is a sort of team of love and mutual support which runs the whole thing. Well, that's a huge issue. But also, another one, second one, the atonement depends on the truth of the Trinity. 
in John's Gospel, chapter 3, through the first 15, 16 verses, it's clear, Jesus explains to Nicodemus this, that the only way into God's kingdom is through faith in the Son, whom the Father sent down to be lifted up, as we know on the cross, lifted up in sacrificial death, and then through being born again of the Holy Spirit. So the gospel is the combined action of the whole of the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Our salvation depends on that cooperation. We saw it last week in Ephesians 1. The Father is the originator of salvation, the Son procured it, and the Holy Spirit communicates it. The Father originated it, the Son procured it, the Holy Spirit communicates it. Brings it to actual reality in our lives. We taste it, we experience it in the Holy Spirit. And in fact, the Holy Spirit brings us into an experience of God. It's awesome stuff. Our salvation really does depend on the triunity of God. From God the Father, in and through Christ, actualized by the Holy Spirit in our lives. If we downgrade any one of those, if we downgrade the Son, downgrade the Spirit, those are the two things we're most likely to do, then we do not have the full, complete, glorious salvation the Bible gives us. We really don't. The Trinity truth is somehow vital to that. I tell you, there's many things it gives us. This is a subsection of that one, not another point. But the Trinity truth helps us to, 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 it's awesome really, to understand that in some way, suffering has come in through sin, not individual sins always linked, I'm not saying that, but suffering has come in through sin. And in order to deal with it, God himself has suffered. Suffering is so unavoidable that God is not some monolith here who doesn't suffer and who forgives or does whatever. Jesus suffered. God bled on Calvary. God suffered for our sin. God involved himself and in order to bring us through and out from the consequences of sin, he suffered. The Trinity is about really God got his hands dirty. Not God the Father sat here and sent some created being like a super angel to do his work for him, but God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. That's awesome, isn't it? That means God got down here with us. God gets his hands there. But also it means the other side of that coin, God brings us up to him. We really are born of the Spirit. We really do enter his family. We are brought into the next point, a relationship with a living God. This is the next. The reality of our relationship with a living God depends on the Trinity. I'm just saying it now. But it is spelt out in Scripture. I think on the screen will go John 1, verses 10 to 14. It should be the next slide. It says, "He." this is about Jesus. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, this is what I've been saying, God was down here with us. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, it's Trinitarian all over the place. That's what they experienced. That's what they knew had happened. That's what they saw had happened. That's what they even experienced had happened. But look what it means. He gave us the right to become children of God. We become genuinely part of God's family. It's not a a sleight of hand or some sort of contract. It is an amazing thing. We can call our God Father, Abba, Father, because God himself has brought us into his family and lives in us by the Holy Spirit. It really is awesome stuff. All through the New Testament, Ephesians 2.18, let's just glance at that too. Uh, It'll go up on your screen, I hope. It summarises it about Jesus. For through him, Jesus, we both have access, both being Jews and Gentiles in context, anybody, in other words, who comes to Christ. Through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. 
the whole of the Trinitarian God fully involved in our salvation, but fully in relationship with us. So Jesus is like our brother. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. God is our Abba, Father, and the Spirit is linking us to make that a reality. So we, through the Spirit, have access to the Father. We really do have connection with the living God. Do you believe that? I believe that. I really believe it. Because I think that's, as best I understand, that's what the Bible's saying, isn't it? So we are one with him. Jesus said it too, didn't he? He said, you're going to be one with the Father. We'll make our dwelling with you. And it is hard to understand, but it's not so hard to believe. You've just got to accept it. Sometimes we say, oh, that's hard to believe. Well, let's believe it. It might be hard to understand it, but let's believe it. That isn't throwing your brain away. God will show you the logics of some of it. I can put it that way. It's not that you forget to use your mind, but you don't get there through your mind. You get there by faith in the truth that God has revealed. Final point. The Trinity shows us God is a missionary God. And this is very relevant to how we're going to pray this week. We're going to pray a lot for ourselves. We're going to pray for our mission. We're going to pray for our call to reach out. But let's just remember this point that comes out from Trinitarian truth. Listen. You see, the Father sent the Son on a mission in the power of the Holy Spirit. The mission was to redeem the world and actually to extend the community of the Trinity. That's the best way I can put it. To extend the family. God wanted many sons. Many daughters, you could say, but it's sons because it's in Christ. They're all enjoying all his benefits. Co-heirs, joint heirs with him. And so the father wanted, as it were, to, out of love, to multiply himself, to, to extend his family. And that's what redemption does. There's a mission to reach out and extend the love, arms of love from God. The Godhead, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, could have been the ultimate inner circle, the ultimate cosy huddle, the ultimate clique to end all cliques totally absorbed in their own glory, totally absorbed in their own relationship, totally satisfied with one another. And in a sense, they were. And yet, out of the very essence of being loving and relational and creative, they somehow, if I can put it this way, designed or developed the concept of creation and ultimately of redemption from the fall, but out of that, beyond that, of expanding their family and having others brought to glory with them, raised above angels, made children of God, filled with the Spirit, born of the Spirit. They, it cost them to break out of that inner circle, this is the Godhead, and, and, and win you and me to themselves. And the whole of creation... The whole of redemption is a sort of mission by the Godhead. Now, you, you can say, but it's all got so much funny stuff in it, John. Yeah, you have to work all through. There's, a, there's the fall, there's loads of stuff to work through. But we're not on the whole deal this morning. What we're receiving is the truth that God loves people. And he loves you. And God knows what love is. And out of his own loving relationship in himself, he expects or extended his arms to create and ultimately redeem you and his love cost him, cost him dearly. And in his mysterious wisdom, he created us like we are with a high degree of freedom so that the whole thing would be genuine. We're not like the angels, we're different. We're a different sort of being. But God has brought us into his own circle. Now this, this sent thing, this sent on a mission, it comes all through the New Testament. It's in John 3.16, the Father so loved the world that he sent his Son. You go through it a number of times. I just want to read you one scripture in Luke. It's not going to be on the screen. I think the reference might be. But I just want to read you Luke 4. This is Jesus declaring at the beginning what he was about, really. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. There it is again. Jesus, the Son of God, in the power of the Spirit. They both seem to be operating. The news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. 
the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, God has done what he promised he was going to do. He has sent me to proclaim freedom, to to be the anointed one who preaches good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, release to the oppressed, proclaiming the year of favour from God. Now, Jesus had a great sense of being sent. He was on a mission all the time. The Father had sent him on a mission. The Father sent the Son, then the Son sent the Spirit. And the Spirit came on the mission to multiply the mission. The Son had procured it, now the Spirit is going to enable us to fulfil what they really had in mind, which is reaching all Adam's fallen sons. He's going to have a body, Jesus, on earth, of people filled with the Spirit, filled with God, who are out there with the mission on their hearts of God's love. This mission, proclaiming freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, release to the oppressed, the year of the Lord's favour, the time of God's favour. Good news for the poor in spirit and the poor in any way. Now, that mission is our mission. We're, but listen, we're caught up in God's mission. It's not like God's sitting there, his ivory tower, as I keep saying, sending us now to do stuff. And he's never got his hands dirty. He is the missionary God. He's come out. He sent the Son. He's got out. And now he says, you do what I do. And so, actually, the whole anointing of the Holy Spirit is for mission in the New Testament. That the Holy Spirit sheds abroad in our hearts God's love. And God's love is an outgoing love. It's a love for others, for the unlovely. That's how it is all the time. Jesus went around doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. That's the heart of God. And that's what what he's put into us. That's what the Holy Spirit's all about. And when Jesus, uh, at the Great Commission, at the end, he says to the disciples, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's in a context, the mission. Go, and I am with you always. I mean, that he said, get into my business, and you'll find I'm with you. This is what I'm about. I'm about love. I'm about expanding the community. Expanding the community. This is what the Godhead did. Here we were, great, got on ever so well together, and we've expanded the community. And that's what you'll keep doing. Expand the community. That's how the Trinity works. Love one another, submit to one another, honour one another, but expand the community. That's what it's all about. That's exactly how the Trinity works. Exactly. So it's not that they forget about each other. Oh, I forgot about the Father. I'm so busy saving the world. No, they're, they're still in relationship. They love each other and yet they still expand because real love is like that. When you're married and you have a loving relationship, thank God I have and we've got a lovely marriage for many years. I enjoy Marion. She enjoys me. But our, our community expanded a bit. It expanded first with one, then two, then three. And the funny thing is you love them all. It's like love's got room. You still love Marion. You don't, don't think, oh, I haven't, got any time. I haven't got any love left for you. I've poured it all out on the kids. No, it doesn't work like that. Some people end up behaving like that. That is totally unnecessary. Real love does not work like that. Because there's mutual support, there's mutual submission, there's mutual understanding, the whole 1 Corinthians 13 thing. And, and then out from that, you can expand the same qualities to others. It's an amazing, it's because it's God, that's what God's like. God's love. That's how the Trinity works. And that's how his people are meant to work. A loving community that can still expand and expand with good news for the poor. So the Trinity is the highest revelation that God has given us of he himself. And it gets us right into the heart of what he's about. It's a challenge. To understand it is hard. Someone said this, the Trinity is a truth that tests our dedication to the principle that God is smarter and bigger than we are. Just repeat that, because I was slightly distracted. The Trinity is a truth that tests our dedication to the principle that God is smarter 
and bigger than we are. I think some Americans said that. Sounds like it, doesn't it? Bless them. That's a very good way of putting it. You know, do you really understand that God is smarter and bigger than you are? Well, he is. And the Trinity tests you out on that. The immensity of the doctrine makes it a mystery. And it is mysterious. But it is a wonderful, wonderful truth. And we need to enjoy it and we need to revel in it and we need to receive it as true. Let me finish with these words from Jonathan Edwards. Now, Jonathan Edwards was not a long jump man. Jonathan Edwards, 200 years or more ago, was the leader of revival in North America and a very able preacher and a very, very wise thinker. But in his diary, I think it was, he wrote this. And this shows he was a man full of the Spirit. Sometimes, this is his words, sometimes only mentioning a single word caused my heart to burn within me. Or only seeing the name of Christ or the name of some attribute of God. And God has appeared glorious to me on account of the Trinity. It has made me have exalting thoughts of God that he subsists in three persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost. The sweetest joys and delights I have experienced have, been, have not been those that have arisen from a hope of my own good estate, but in a direct view of the glorious things in the gospel. Now, it's old language, but what he's saying is, what really gets me is not what God's done for me, hope of my own good estate. We don't quite talk like that nowadays, do we? What really stirs my heart is just looking at God himself. That's what he's saying. And understanding the Trinity. And understanding that the awesome nature of God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That gives me my sweetest joys, the delights I've experienced as I've taken on the glorious truths from the gospel. Amen.